Thank you, Jim, and good morning. It is uh, a text I've taken from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10. We're going to look at verses 1 through 10. It's uh, Christmas Eve, and so I've taken a break from the Gospel of Mark to look specifically at the very reason we celebrate Christmas. Not that uh, this is uh, something we need to do. We're not uh, commanded to have certain days of the year that we celebrate such things as the Lord's birth, the Lord's resurrection, but we do that, and I think it's a helpful thing, a good thing to, to take time and look at that, is that event, his birth, and look at his resurrection at that time during the year. But uh, this is something really we should do every day of the year. Uh, for the Christian, every day is Christmas. For the Christian, every day is Easter. Every day is a day in which we live in light of the incarnation, the crucifixion and resurrection of our Lord. But it is, as I say, I think good to take time out of the year and look specifically at this great event. And this passage came to my mind as I was considering what to teach because it gives us the problem that the world has and the solution. And it brings out very clearly who our Savior is and what He's done. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning with verse 1. For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says... Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have, not, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. After saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin... You have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Some of you will remember the name Dwayne Thomas. He was a running back who had a brief but storied career with the Dallas Cowboys. Dwayne wasn't a talker, but he was a thinker. For Super Bowl VI, he was asked about playing in the game. The interviewer called it the ultimate game the Super Bowl. Dwayne answered, if it's the ultimate game, how come they're playing it again next year? <laughs> I wonder if any of the ancient Israelites asked that question about their sacrifices, especially about the great Day of Atonement. If it's the Day of Atonement, how come we're doing it again next year? If, if they hadn't asked that, they should have, because the very fact that the sacrifice had to be repeated and was repeated year after year demonstrated that it was not the ultimate sacrifice. It didn't actually atone for sin, didn't actually remove guilt and gain forgiveness. Otherwise, they would not have done it again next year. That's the point that the author of Hebrews makes at the beginning of chapter 10. 
Sacrifices were offered continually year by year, but they could not make perfect those who drew near to the altar. Otherwise, he asked, would they not have ceased to be offered? That's a rhetorical question, and the answer, of course, is yes. If the sacrifices had fixed the problem, the sin problem that separated man from God, it would have ceased. But it didn't. It had to be repeated year after year, century after century. So what was the problem? The problem was the sacrifice. Whether it was a goat on the Day of Atonement or other animal sacrifices offered at any other time. For the writer explains in verse 4, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Now that could be very discouraging. After all, if the priestly service the prayers and incense and rivers of sacrificial blood at the holy shrine of the tabernacle could not remove sin, what could? And if all of that could not atone for sin and remove our guilt, what could we possibly do to gain God's acceptance? The author of this book would say, nothing. Left to ourselves, we are helpless and hopeless. But that was not a failure of the Day of Atonement. In fact, its purpose was never to take away sin, but to remind people of sin and to be a picture of the ultimate sacrifice that would remove sin and make us clean. That's what the writer says in verse 1, that the law and all of its sacrifices, especially the sacrifices of the Day of Atonement, was a shadow of what was to come. Why a shadow? Because a shadow is only a reflection of the reality. We speak of casting a shadow. It goes before a person and signals his or her approach. It's not the person not the real thing. Shadows have no substance, no weight. Nevertheless, a shadow is connected to the real thing. It, it reflects the outline of that person or thing. It gives a silhouette. It casts an image of it. The law, with its sacrifices, was like that. Those sacrifices lacked the power to remove sin. But they did cast an image of what and who would do that. The Day of Atonement foreshadowed the remedy to come. It had to be different from a bull or a goat. No animal could take away mankind's sin. Only a man could do that. Only a man, a human person, could be a substitute for people. That's what Christ did. That is what Christ was. The promised one of the Old Testament prophets, which is the reason for what we are celebrating today, this Christmas Eve, the birth of Christ. He was the long-expected Savior, the ultimate sacrifice, the last sacrifice. He came to do what the law could not do, what all of those bloody sacrifices didn't achieve, which was to make us perfect. Never think of the birth of Jesus without thinking of his death. Never think of the manger where the baby was laid without thinking of the cross where the Savior was nailed. His death was not only pictured in those shadowy sacrifices on the bloody altar, it was foretold by the ancient prophets. One of those prophecies is Psalm 40 that's quoted here in verses 5 through 7. <clears throat> Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. And whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me 
to do your will, O God. Psalm 40 is titled a Psalm of David. It is a psalm that was probably written after he had enjoyed some great deliverance, delivered from some enemy, maybe Saul, that was so often the one that pursued him. And so having experienced this great miraculous deliverance from the Lord, out of gratitude, David vowed obedience. But the author of Hebrews recognized <clears throat> that these words could not refer to David absolutely. David was a godly man. David was a great man. He was the greatest king Israel had, but he was not a perfect man. We know that. And no man does obedience with perfection. No one does, no one can. Only Christ did that. Only Christ is the spotless Lamb of God. But also the words of the psalm fit Christ and His unique birth. Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. That's an unusual statement when you reflect upon it. Behold, I come. That's Jesus' favorite way of describing His birth as a coming in John chapter 6 and verse 38, he states clearly from where he came and why he came. I have come down from heaven, he said, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And that is just what Psalm 40 describes. His willingness to come from heaven and to do God's will on earth which he said in Mark chapter 10, verse 45 was, to give his life a ransom for many. He came to be a sacrifice. Now there's no account of Jesus saying these words of Psalm 40, not in the Gospels, not anywhere in the New Testament, but they express his mind and his resolution in coming into the world. So the author of Hebrews correctly interpreted them of him. David, guided by the Holy Spirit, wrote a prophecy of Christ coming into the world and what he would do here. He came to be obedient to a mission. He was sent into this world on a mission of salvation. And for that purpose, a body was prepared for him. Not only a body of flesh and blood, but a, a human nature, a reasonable soul, a rational mind of thought, will, and feelings. He was a whole man. He was a real man. How his body was prepared isn't explained here. In fact, the closest thing we get to an explanation is found in Luke chapter 1 and verse 35, where Mary was told by the angel Gabriel, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. The Holy Spirit overshadowed her. It was a, a mysterious description of the Holy Spirit's work of conception in which He created the Lord's human nature, body and soul, from His mother Mary by filtering out her sin to make for him a human nature and make him the holy child. God and man were joined together in one person. The God-man, conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. That's how he came. Now why did God do it that way? He, he could have made a body out of dirt, just as he did for Adam, could have even made it in heaven by divine fiat and sent his son into this world as the angel of the Lord. But then, if Christ had not come through the human race, he would not have been connected to us. And not being one of us, he would have been unable to represent the race and be a substitute for sin. A substitute to gain salvation. But because he was conceived miraculously in the womb of a virgin, descended from Adam, born as we all are of a woman, he was a real man. As the writer says uh, earlier in this book, he partook of flesh and blood as we do. 
Because of all of that, He was one of us. And that's why bulls and goats and lambs and doves could never really represent us. Only a man can represent men and women, people. Christ could do that. He was from us, from Adam. And He came in this way to do God's will. And that's very important. That's a point that the psalm makes and a point that the author emphasizes. To do God's will. No animal could do that. Neither a lamb nor a goat could have ever done that or ever said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. They lacked understanding, of course. And they were unwilling sacrifices. They'd been, they, they had been dragged to the altar and, and had to be tied down on it. No unwilling sacrifice could be acceptable to God. Christ was willing. He understood completely what was at stake, and He chose to go forward with it. In fact, in chapter 12 of this book, in verse 2, the author writes that He endured the cross. He endured the pain and the shame of the cross for the joy set before Him. What was that joy? What was it that encouraged Him to go forward? Well, it was the joy of doing the will of God, for one. As His Son, He perfectly obeyed His Father. But it was also the joy of knowing that by His death, He would redeem sinners. He would save them out of slavery to sin and death and make them God's children, make them His brothers and sisters, forgiven and heirs of eternal life. He was building a family through His death. And that gave him great joy and incentive. He was born of a woman, but he came out of heaven. He is the eternal Son of God who came here to save the lost. In fact, if he were not God the Son, equal with the Father in person, power, and glory, he could not have done his Father's will. His human death, if that's all it was, would have been meaningless, just another death. It's because His humanity was united with deity that His sacrifice had infinite and eternal value. It could remove unlimited sins and save countless souls because it was the death of the God-man. His death changed everything. It changed both sinners and covenants. The arrangement and law that uh, governed the life of God's people. That's what the writer explains next in verses 8 through 10. The Lord established a new covenant, uh, a new way of governing our lives. As he put it in verse 9, he takes away the first in order to establish the second. He ended the old covenant with its endless animal sacrifices and burdensome laws to establish the new covenant based on His own once-for-all sacrifice. When the reality came, the shadow ceased. And all who are a part of that new covenant, that new relationship with God, which is all of grace, sovereign grace, all are fully and forever forgiven and accepted by God and acceptable to Him. Well, the author wrote in verse 10, By this will, that is by God's will, by God's eternal plan of salvation, His decree that He would save a people for Himself, that the Lord followed, that the Lord Jesus Christ came to establish and execute, by this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now in that one word, sanctified, the author is describing the entire Christian experience from regeneration to glorification, from the new birth and faith to our resurrection. And in the present time, God looks on us, looks on the believer as that, as complete, as 
as righteous in His sight with the righteousness of Christ and the obedience and the perfection of Christ. Now, we're not perfect. We are, we are sinners still, and we will be to the day we die. But we are cloaked in the righteousness of Christ. Every believer is justified, declared righteous, and that is how God looks upon us, and that is how God treats us. The, the rivers of blood that flowed from the altar over the long centuries of time could not do that could not wash away one sin, and certainly could not make perfect. But that is what Christ's sacrifice did for every believer. Nothing can be added to it. His sacrifice was complete. It is, as the author says, once for all, never to be played again next year. Now, do you understand the significance of that? It means that there is nothing for you to do. Nothing you could try to do could be a benefit. You are a sinner. All of us are sinners. And you, if you're a regular attender here, know that. You hear that all the time. If you're a visitor and that sounds a little strange or even offensive, it's the teaching of the Word of God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's true of every one of us. We're sinners. And our sin is, is damning, eternally damning. And the stain is so deep, you cannot wash it away. Only Christ's death can do that. And it was effective. It alone washes and make, makes the believer white as snow. That's what we have as we look, into, look to Christ and believe in Him. That's what the sinner has as he or she takes hold of the cross through faith. They're forgiven, made white as snow. Now that's all one can do, is believe, is trust. All striving ceases. We, we are to believe in Him. We are to receive His gift as with an empty and open hand and rest. Rest. Now that is so simple. The gospel is very simple. It's so simple and yet it is so hard for people to understand. Martin Luther understood. I think of him not only because this is the 500th year of the beginning of the Reformation, but because I have been reading some of his letters, letters that he wrote over his entire uh, ministry, um, letters that were intended to give spiritual counsel. In one to a friend and fellow monk dated April 8, 1516, a year and a half before he nailed the 95 Theses to the door in Wittenberg, he asked this monk, is your soul tired of its own righteousness? Luther knew what he was asking. He had worn himself out trying to produce his own righteousness. He said prayers, confessed sins, paid penance, did menial tasks, religious stuff. But the more he did, the more the weight of guilt only increased. In fact, he said, if I had kept on any longer, I should have killed myself with vigils, prayers, reading, and other work. His own righteousness didn't exist, and he couldn't produce it. He finally realized that. He finally realized that the only righteousness that God accepts is the righteousness that God provides. It's the righteousness that He gives the believer. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's what Luther called the great exchange. Christ took my sin upon Himself, was punished for it, and then at the moment of faith, His righteousness was imputed to me, assigned to me. The great exchange. So I told his friend, you will find peace only in Him and only when you despair of yourself and your own works. Anything you try to grab onto for salvation other than Christ and His sacrifice, religious ceremonies, your good deeds, whatever they may be, 
is like grabbing a shadow. There's nothing there. It's an illusion. Christ was born into this world in order to replace the shadow with the reality, to be the ultimate sacrifice, the last sacrifice that ends all sacrifices, and in that way gain salvation for everyone who believes, whoever he or she may be. Now, that is the ground for assurance and great encouragement. In fact, the greatest encouragement in this life and the greatest encouragement in times of distress. We are absolutely secure. What can you do that he has not paid for? What can you yet do that has not yet been covered by his blood and his sacrifice? Nothing. He died for every one of our sins, past, present, and future. And what that says to us is, we can never be lost. Uh, but some will say, oh, that's dangerous. That's just giving people license to sin. No, not at all. There is nothing dangerous about the efficiency and the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice. There is nothing dangerous about the greatness of God's grace. In fact, I know the fact that I know that Christ has wiped the slate, the slate clean of all my sin and guilt should produce within me gratitude and incentive not to sin but to obey. That's what the greatness of grace does. It's the incentive to righteousness and obedience. I'm not suggesting that no one has ever used grace as a pretext for sin. I know that that's happened, but I think it unlikely that such a person understands grace or really received it. Grace is the greatest incentive to obedience, and, and that is another lesson here. We are to be like Christ. We are to follow His example, not for salvation. In fact, if we were to believe that the gospel was about the great example that Jesus has given and we should follow his example and by following his example we'll become acceptable to God, then we'd be on an, an impossible road and never reach salvation. No one can do that. No, we're not to follow his example for salvation, but having been saved, having been justified, having been accepted by God and made one of his children and put into his family, we're to follow our Lord's example. Do what He does. Do God's will. That's verse 7. That characterized His life. Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. If we're joined to Christ through faith, we are joined to His life. And that means we're joined to not only the way he, what He does, but what He thinks and what He desires. And it's to be our desire to live like Him, to be like Him. Obedience in the Christian life is not an option. And by being joined to His life, we are joined to His power so that we can obey. As I said, it's not an option. It is required of us in the best of times and the worst of times when we wax and when we wane, when we prosper and when we suffer. And we do suffer, and some suffer great trials. In fact, that's what the, the church that received this letter was experiencing, and that, in fact, is the reason that the author wrote this letter to them. They were suffering. In fact, they were suffering so much, and they faced such danger that they were thinking about leaving the Christian faith, going back to the synagogue where they thought they might be safe. They were probably a congregation in Rome, and they'd already suffered much, the loss of property and freedom. Some had even gone to jail for their faith. They'd not yet suffered death, as he explains later, but that was becoming likely. They were scared. Some were beginning to waver. Some began to avoid contact with other Christians. They needed encouragement. So, when the letter arrived and word went out, the congregation gathered. It was probably a small congregation, maybe 15 or 20 people that 
came together in a house and they listened to this letter as it was read to them. Kent Hughes, who wrote a commentary on the book of Hebrews, wrote, Through these magnificent words, the beleaguered church was brought face to face with the God who speaks, and this God, through His superior Son, Jesus Christ, would bring them comfort in the midst of life's troubles. Well, that's what this very passage that we're looking at does. It gives the greatest Comfort to the sinner. It says, thousands of sacrifices and rivers of blood cannot wash away one sin. No amount of charity and good deeds can make the guilty innocent. But Christ's death does that for every believer. And it says to the beleaguered saint, the discouraged Christian, don't fear. God could not offer up His only Son for you and forget you in the day of your trial. Christ could not die in your place and neglect you when you were being tested and crushed. He promised at the end of this book, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. That's true. That's comfort for the saved. The Apostle Paul gives the message of Christmas very simply in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. If He saved the chief of sinners, He can save you. No sin is too great to be blotted out. No trial is too great to block His help. The one who saved you will never let you go and will bring you someday safely into His kingdom of light. That's the message for you today. That's the message for the believer in Jesus Christ. The message for the Christian every day. So trust in Him. Rest in Him. Live for Him. We may have visitors here today. Maybe some of you don't know Christ. Maybe you think you don't need to. But then maybe you're becoming tired of your own righteousness. If so, the message from our passage for you is very simple. The last sacrifice for sin and salvation has been made. And that is the only place where you'll find righteousness and acceptance with God. Look to Him. He's made salvation possible. The sacrifice that He made is not going to happen again next year. Christ's sacrifice is the ultimate sacrifice. It's the only one that saves for all eternity. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And if you're a sinner, then come to Him. If you are an unbeliever, trust in Him. He receives all who do. That's His promise. Christmas is when we celebrate the birth of Jesus. What a wonderful time to celebrate your new birth. May God open your eyes to your very great need and bring you to faith in His Son. And for those of you who have believed, I hope it's everyone here, rejoice and rest in Him and live for Him. May God help you to do that. I'm going to close in a word of prayer and then... We'll have another hymn, and then we'll have the privilege of all celebrating the Lord's Supper together. Let's pray.